make a start yeah yeah and you know okay guys good luck Record. recording in progress yeah uh, morning all um, my name is sanjeev anand i'm education secretary for british indian orthopedic society and uh, welcome on sunday morning for uh, what i hope is going to be an excellent session uh this is the latest edition on a series of core curriculum topics in orthopedics we're running uh, for our orthopedic trainees and which we hope, hope to cover the whole range of orthopedics uh these talks are available later on youtube channel uh by the youtube channel for if somebody wants to visit them later and they are also currently streaming on ortho tv uh today's session is on basic science which has been led by excellent team at uh, lester Uh, who have is actually speakers all from Leicester today. So I'm looking forward to this session. I'll hand over to my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Harvinder Singh, uh, who's uh, take the session from now. Thank you. Thanks, Sanjeev, and welcome everybody. Um, we hope you enjoy uh, basic sciences. Um, I have an excellent panel here. I was going to talk about different aspects of basic sciences, and um, if you have any questions. put in the q and a session or the chat session and we will try and answer them as soon as possible uh, i'll hand over to mr pandey who will uh, talk briefly about these webinars and then we'll start the session thank you pandey you are on mute Okay, hello everybody. So it's going to be an exciting hour of basic sciences uh, on this uh, Sunday. Um, we have an excellent facility uh, faculty here. We have Professor Rohan Rajan, who's a consultant at University Hospitals of Derby, and he's an expert on gait. Uh, he runs his own gait analysis lab, and no better person than him to talk about gait. then we have uh, mr asad qureshi who is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon here at university hospitals of leicester and he's one of those orthopedic surgeons who think and uh, and he's quite an he's developing quite a reputation about being an expert in 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 basic sciences so i'm sure he'll keep you entertained uh then we have ms k lamin who's a consultant at um, less university hospitals of leicester and she leads the basic science teaching in our deanery so she'll be uh, talking about imaging in orthopedics then we have our own professor harvinder singh whom you all know um and he is an expert he's our expert in statistics so whenever we have a statistical problem we look up to mr say C- the professor singh and he sorts them out so i'm sure we'll have a feast of uh brilliant lectures from each one of the faculties over to you harvinder thank you so let's start with gait analysis from uh, professor rohan rajan hello i'm uh, professor rajan i'm a professor of orthopedics and biomechanics in gait i've been asked to speak to you about gait analysis The aim is to define gait terminology to describe what happens at the pelvis, hips, knees, ankles and feet during normal gait, to provide you with the tools for day-to-day gait evaluation and to highlight what a gait laboratory has to offer um in terms of the information that can be provided. Gait is defined as the individual's characteristic of walking. Further terminology I'd like to share with you are planes of motion, gait cycle, stride and step lengths, cadence, angle of progression, speed or velocity, stance and swing ratios, kinematics and kinetics. There are three planes of motion. In the sagittal plane, the body is divided into the left and right. The coronal plane divides the body into front and back, and the transverse plane divides the body into upper and lower segments. In the sagittal plane the movements at the pelvis are anterior and posterior tilt in the hip knee and ankle they flexion and extension in the coronal plane then the pelvis is op- pelvic obliquity i.e. up or down for the hip is abduction or adduction 
and for the knee is varus or valgus. And finally, in the transverse plane, the movements for the pelvis are protraction or retraction. For the hip and knee is internal or external rotation, and the foot is in turning or out turning. Easy way to remember for transverse planes as if you're looking at the patient from the top. This is a schematic which shows that a stride consists of two steps. So further gait terminology, gait cycle is a point in time from initial contact to initial contact with the same foot, whilst a step is a period of initial contact from, of one foot to initial contact of the contralateral foot. Stride is the gait cycle and therefore it is the period from initial contact of one foot to initial contact of the same foot, very much like the gait cycle. Step and stride lengths are therefore the distances covered during a step and a stride, and there are two steps per stride. Cadence is the number of steps per minute, and the angle of progression is determined by the two hour angle with respect to the direction of travel. Speed is the distance covered in the known time, which is meters per second. The stance period is the period when the foot is on the ground which is initiated at initial contact and terminated at toe off and makes up about 60% of the gait cycle. The swing period of walking is when the foot is off the ground, which is initiated at toe off and terminated at initial contact, making up 40% of the gait cycle. Hence, the stance swing ratio is usually 60 to 40%. Kinematics is the study of motion of body segments about the joint i.e. joint motion throughout the gait cycle, whilst kinetics is a study of forces that produce the segment motion and from which you can calculate moments and powers. Gait is further divided into several tasks, weight acceptance, single limb support and limb advancement. Weight acceptance and single limb support happen during the stance period, while limb advancement happens during the swing period. In weight acceptance, there are three requirements, shock absorption, stability of the limb accepting the weight, and retention of progression. In the single limb support, um, this is initiated by two off of the contralateral limb and terminated by initial contact with the contralateral limb. The single limb therefore supports the body weight whilst the contralateral limb swings forward. In limb advancement, this is preparation for swing in the swing phase. So here you have the swing and the stance period consisting of initial contact, loading response, mid stance, terminal stance, pre-swing, initial swing, mid swing and terminal swing phases of the gait cycle with their respective percentages of the gait cycle. So to summarize, the gait cycle or stride consists of two periods, the stance and the swing periods. This consists of three tasks. In the stance period, you have weight acceptance and single limb support. And in the swing period, you have limb advancement. And this goes on to the 10, uh, to, sorry, to the phases, the different phases such as initial contact, loading response, mid stance, terminal stance, pre-swing, initial swing, mid swing, and terminal swing. This is a schematic of the gait cycle. It starts off with initial contact with heel strike and then loading response with a heel strike to foot flat, and then to mid stance, terminal stance, pre-swing, initial swing, mid swing, and finally terminal swing. The prerequisites of gait are stability in stance, sufficient foot clearance in swing, pre-positioning of the ankle in swing, adequate step length, and energy conservation. With regards to pre-positioning of the ankle, you have three rockers. The first rocker, um, first rocker happens at loading response with eccentric work of with eccentric uh, contraction of the dorsiflexes to allow the forefoot to go down to the floor in a controlled manner without slapping on the floor. In the second rocker the tibia or the shank progresses over the stable foot and eccentric uh, contracture of the plantar flexors in the calf prevent the shank uh, from progressing too quickly and progresses in a stable controlled manner. However, in the 
Third rocker, now you have concentric work the plantar flexors to lift the heel, therefore lengthen the leg and provide, provide propulsion to maximize stride length. There are differences between adults and children. In children, the, the, there is a wider base of support. The stride is shorter, the speed is lower and cadence is higher. There is lack of heel strike because they tend to have a, foot, a flat foot strike instead. There's increased knee flexion in stance and the leg tends to be externally rotated in swing. In addition, there's absence of reciprocal arm swing. As the gait matures, the heel strike, knee flexion and external rotation reach adult pattern by age 2. The walking base and arm swing reach the adult pattern by age 4. Stride length and speed increase with age and height and cadence reduces, reaches maturation by the age of 15 at the end of growth. EMG studies have shown that there's increased activity throughout the great cycle in children under seven years of age. These are the measurements that we can provide from the gate laboratory for you. Cadence, velocity, stride length, step length, percentage stance, and angle of progression. There are two types of gate analysis. Observational gate analysis, you use your eyes, and video gate analysis. In the gate laboratory, we use various instruments as well. With observational gait analysis, this is a visual record of gait. It relies on very good memory from you, but often the motion is too fast for your eyes to capture everything as you try to look at the different rev levels of the patient at different planes, from the head and the trunk and upper limb movement to the lower limb and foot contact, etc. It tends to rely on your good memory, it tends to be very tiring for the patients if you are, as you ask them, ask them to walk up and down several times so that you can gather your thoughts and tends to be very subjective. Kinematics, I told you this is a motion of body segments about a joint. Uh, in order to provide kinematic graphs, we attach uh, stickers to the bony landmarks on the patient, which are picked up by infrared cameras in order to produce these graphs. These are two standard deviations of say pelvic tilt, oblique, uh, uh, pelvic obliquity or pelvic rotation in the sagittal plane, the coronal plane and the transverse plane respectively. And likewise, hip flexion, extension, hip abduction, induction and hip rotation. So I'd like to give you an example of a patient with a Trendelenburg gait. As you can see from the middle graph, which is the coronal plane, the two standard deviations are the grey lines uh, whereas the green and the red lines are the right and the left side of the pelvis. And you can see where the, on the normals, the pelvis is up, the, if this patient is down, and where it's down, this patient is up. So that may, this patient is doing the opposite of normal, and this is an example of a Trendelenburg gait. This patient has cerebral palsy. You can see on the sagittal plane, on the left, that the hip is mainly in flexion because the, he, he has a hip flexion contracture with the psoas tightness and in addition on the coronal plane the hip tends to be adducted because of scissoring. This same patient also has on the sagittal plane uh, left graph uh, the knees in flexion in a flexed attitude because of flexion contracture and in the ankles there's excessive dorsiflexion so clearly this patient has a fixed flexion contraction of the hips and knees which has, result, um, which has resulted also in excessive dorsiflexion because of a crouch gait. Kinetics uh, measures the forces uh, that produce the segment motions. Uh, we use force plates to measure this, from which we can then calculate moments and powers. Uh, we also use video vectors to visualize and estimate the position and size of the ground reaction force um, to a patient. And this is very useful for orthotic and prosthet prosthetic management and alignment, uh, for example, fixed air force, etc. So here's a patient walking over the force plate, and as he walks over the force plate, you can see where the ground reaction force is into the ground reaction force and you can tell whether the ground reaction force is anterior or posterior to hip and knee uh, especially on the, with the sagittal uh, videos this is a coronal video so ground reaction forces under with a normal gait the gf the ground reaction force is anterior to the hip and anterior to the knee until toe off 
This helps to produce an extensor force. In terminal stance, the ground reaction force is posterior to the hip and knee and produces a flexion force. However, if your tendon actually is excessive long, excessive, excessive, excessively long in a crouch gait, then you have weak plantar flexion. The ground reaction force tends to be anterior to the hip and posterior to the knee, resulting in this crouch gait, and therefore you expend more energy to resist the ground reaction force. We can also measure EMGs of individual muscles in the lower limb to make sure that the muscles are firing at the right time of the gait cycle. This is an example where there's excessive firing of many of the muscles in a patient with cerebral palsy. Other measurements include pedographic pressure studies, uh, uh, energy costs, and heart rate indices. This is an example where we could measure you know, to show you that we can measure individual pressures under individual uh, metatarsal heads and also um, at the heel, uh, which we use to publish a paper to look at the um, um, the transference of pressures from the lateral column during hallux rigidus in, in an antalgic gait to, towards the medial column following first NTPJ replacement. We can also look at foot kinematics um, using um, the markers I described earlier and we've published a paper we showed that following first NTPJ replacement foot kinematics were restored to normal with improved uh, temporal spatial parameters such as stride length, cadence, and velocity. With regards to energy, the majority of, uh, of kinetic energy is provided by inertia. We conserve energy by minimizing the movements of the center of gravity, controlling momentum, transfer of energy between body segments, especially in the ankle rockers. So in pathological gait, for example, with ankle fusion, um, you can increase the um, energy expenditure by up to 3%, with knee immobilization by 23%, and with hip fusion uh, by 32%. In partial weight bearing, you can increase your uh, energy expenditure by uh, a third, and uh, when you're not weight bearing by more than two thirds. With a below knee amputation, but up to 20%, above knee amputation by a third, and with hemipelvectomy, up to 100%. With that, I thank you. I uh, apologize for the slight interruption. So that is a problem with videoing at home. Um, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to uh, ask. Thank you. Right, thank you, Professor Rajan. If anybody has any burning questions, you can ask us this stage okay i think should we go on to the next presentation then yeah we can have some questions at the end also harvinder so anybody wants to ask questions can either write it in the chat box or can ask them at the end of the four talks okay uh, great i'm going to go on to mr Qureshi's, uh talk and he's going to talk about stress strain curves Hi, it's Asad Qureshi. Um, I'm giving a presentation today on uh, basic science relating to metals. Uh, sorry, my voice has gone a little. Um, so let's start from the beginning. So usually in the basic science of either, you'll be given a prop. So this is the typical uh, diagram you'll be given off a stress strain curve. And it's very important to understand this. So at the beginning, uh, you'll be asked, you know, what, what does this represent? What mechanical test is being performed? What material do you think this is? And then you'll be asked definitions, uh, usually starting off with, you know, what are the axes? What is stress? What is strain? So definitions. Uh, it's very important in the exam that you're able to give precise definitions and not ideas. Um, so when you're asked as to what is a force, a force is the action of one body on another, which is relatively simple. Um, there's different types of force profiles, as we know, compression, tension, torsion, bending, and shear. Um, but the important thing is to get the definition right in the first place. 
So what is stress? By extension, stress is force per unit area. So if you think about pounds per square inch, um, any type of force over cross-sectional area. Strain, strain is a measure of the amount of deformation which is happening in response to a given stress, and therefore it doesn't have any units. So in essence, when we pull on something and it deforms, to what extent is does this deformation occur quantitatively in response to the stress? And it's often expressed as Poisson's ratio, uh, where we have um, the deformed geometry expressed as a function of the initial geometry. So let's go back to the curve. So the first thing you'd probably be asked is what is happening in this first part of the curve where there's a linear rise uh, between stress and strain? And what does this mean for the actual structure of the metal? What is happening to explain this mechanical behavior? So for this, we do need to understand what is the structure of metal? So when we look at the bonding between different elements, we have covalent bonds where two atoms of a different nature will share electrons and then create a bond. And this is very directional and specific. Similarly, with an ionic bond, you will have one atom will give up <clears throat> its outer valency electrons uh, to a neighboring atom, which will take them on for a stable configuration. And that, again, is quite a, a unidirectional bond with very specific properties. <clears throat> the metallic bond is different in the sense that we've got all these metal atoms all together, and they give up all of their outer valency electrons to form this sea of electrons which can actually move around uh, and that's what imparts thermal and electrical conductivity to metals so when we look at the atoms and how they are spatially arranged uh, this graph shows what happens to the energy levels as the intraatomic distance increases so you can see that there's very high potential energy when the atoms are very close together because they're repelled but as the distance between them increases there is attraction to a point where when you increase the distance further the attractive forces are minimized so there is an equilibrium point where the atoms have a bonding force uh, existing between repulsion and no attraction. So if we express this curve in the opposite way, where rather than potential energy, we look at the force of the bonding, we can see that as the intraatomic separation increases, it, the force of bonding is very low. It's almost negative whilst there's repulsion, but then there's a point where the bonding force is optimized because of the distance between the atoms, after which, as you separate the atoms, the distance decreases. So the gradient of this curve is very important for individual atoms because that dictates the resistance they have to intraatomic separation. So extrapolating this curve to our stress strain curve, we can see that different types of atoms have a different extent of intraatomic separation for a given force, and that is effectively dictates their bonding force. So the gradient for the bonding force effectively equates to the gradient for this part of the stress strain curve, where as the stress is imparted, the lattice deforms by stretching out. And so the energy required to stretch that lattice determines how much deformation you get for a given force. And this is expressed as Young's modulus, which is the gradient. So effectively stress over strain. So the steeper the gradient, the more force you require to stretch this lattice. So looking at the elastic portion of the curve, we've defined Young's modulus as the gradient for this part of the curve. And this relates to the resistance to intraatomic separation of the crystal lattice. And this is reversible deformation. So that when we release the lattice at any point along this curve, so we take away the stress, the lattice snaps back to its original shape and size. So this is elastic reversible deformation. So what happens beyond the elastic limit? So we can see here that as we go beyond the elastic limit, or the limit of proportionality because stress and strain are proportional, we can see that the relationship is no longer proportional. So for a given amount of stress, we don't always have the same amount of strain. The other important aspect of this curve is if we 
take away the stress at any point. And so we unload the material. It does not go back all the way down to zero strain. It follows a similar path back down the curve parallel to the elastic portion. But you can see here where the arrow takes us. Actually, there is some residual strain. It's not zero strain. So there is deformation that is irreversible. So what is happening in the metal to explain this? So sometimes people will venture this answer that, oh, these bonds, are they being broken? And then the whole structure is moving on and then new bonds are being made. Um, I mean, if this was the case, then what it means is that every time we bent a metal plate, we would be unleashing enough energy uh, equivalent to like a thermonuclear detonation. And I mean, that's one thing you never see in the movies where there's Godzilla or some other, you know, external threat to the planet. And someone's gone to an orthopedic surgeon and asked them to bend a plate. So there has to be another mechanism for what's occurring. There has to be something that explains why we're having deformation within the metal in response to this increasing stress and it's non-linear. So what mechanism can explain this behavior of the graph? So we have to once again go back to the metal as a structural material and how it's composed. So obviously the metal is made up of lots of atoms. And what we find is, is that the atoms pack together. And depending on the type of atom, they will pack differently. So iron will tend to favor this body-centered cubic pattern where there's one atom in the middle and then the surrounding atoms are arranged in a cube around it. Aluminium adopts a face-centered cubic, which has a greater packing ratio because the atoms can nestle in closer. And zinc has a hexagonal close packed ratio. Essentially, all these packing unit cells are repeated endlessly throughout the lattice to give you essentially a whole load of stacked atoms with the spatial orientation. However, it's not so simple because when we look at metal, it doesn't have a uniform appearance. You know, when we look at it under a microscope and when we often look at it like this, we can see that it actually has this very granular uh, appearance. And the reason is, is that as a metal cools and these atoms come together, they start forming lattices and the metal lattices that form, they may all be the same type of lattice, but they have different orientations. The lattices grow and they coalesce together. Because the lattices are at different orientations, they can't directly bond with each other. So then you have these boundaries forming effectively, defining individual grains within where the lattice is orientated in a specific direction. So if we look at that here, when we look at a metal uh, under a microscope, we see that there's individual grains or crystals composed of the same repeating lattice, but in different orientations. So this is important to understand. Within the lattice itself, there are numerous imperfections. So the sort of imperfections you can have is on the left, you can see that we've got in one row of atoms with is incomplete and the rest of the lattice is distorted around it. And that is called an edge dislocation. The other type of distortion we see in the lattice is what we call a screw dislocation, where suddenly one layer drops down into the one below. So these imperfections mean that when we look at the lattice as a whole, it's not really a regular structure. It's actually quite distorted in places. So what happens when we load this distorted structure? So what you can see here at the top in ABC is that we've got this edge dislocation, this incomplete layer of atoms. And as we load or impart force to this lattice, that edge dislocation can actually jump through. So essentially bonds can break to make a complete layer and then a new incomplete layer may form. So in that sense, this dislocation, as there's stress imparted, it travels through the lattice. And below that, you can see that the screw dislocation can similarly move through the lattice as force is applied. It's important to note that each dislocation has a preferred direction of movement due to this atomic arrangement. So each dislocation has what we call a favored slip plane dictated by Berger's vector. I don't think it's important to know anything more than these terms, really. But just to know that dislocations do move, and we call this slip, and they slip along favored planes.
So why does this dislocation movement introduce a non-linear stress-strain relationship? So the dislocation movement depends on the applied force being in the same plane as the slip plane. So you can imagine if you apply a force and the dislocations that are preferentially aligned with that slip plane, they'll move first, whereas the dislocations which aren't, they won't move because they need more force. So some dislocations are more easier to move than others. Some just won't really move because of their uh, atomic orientation around them. So the lattice distortion that happens as these dislocations move, it can create new opportunities for some dislocations to move more easily. But conversely, it can also impact on some dislocations, which were finding it quite easy to travel through the lattice, but now no longer find it as easy. So as force is applied, what we're saying is, is that these dislocations keep moving. So we keep getting plastic deformation. So in essence, the plate should just keep bending and never break. But that doesn't happen. We know that eventually a plate breaks. So how do we explain this behavior happening? So let's think about the fate of the dislocations. So what can happen with dislocations is sometimes when you have an edge dislocation, which is an incomplete layer, it can be traveling along through the lattice and it may come across an incomplete layer, an edge dislocation of the opposite sense. And the two come together and they form a complete layer and they cancel each other out. If you get two edge dislocations that are the same, they will literally crash into each other and they might stop moving. Even if all the dislocations can keep moving through the lattice, eventually they come up against the grain boundary. And now it's very important that we recognize that at the grain boundary, the lattice suddenly changes orientation. And now because it changes orientation, the dislocation can't move, it's trapped. It can't cross the grain boundary. So here we can see there's two grains with different orientations and the slip plane is arrested because once it gets to the grain boundary, the slip plane orientation is not in line with the new lattice on the other side. So eventually, as we impart greater stress to the metal, these dislocations all build up at the grain boundaries. And you can see that here, is that if we had to diagrammatically represent these dislocations, they're all building up at the grain boundaries. And to move the dislocations, which are not preferentially aligned, we need to impart more and more stress. So essentially, to get deformation, we have to keep loading this and it's harder. Enough force and eventually, you know, all the dislocations have moved and there's nowhere to go. And that's when failure happens because the stress is built up at the grain boundary and they're too great and you essentially have a microfracture. So all these microfractures across the grain boundary coalesce and they cause failure. And that's why failure is quite spectacular and sudden. And when we look at the metal fractured surface, it undulates. And what we see on a microscopic level are all those grain boundaries. So in summary, what we've seen is that metals have characteristic stress strain curves. And essentially, we're looking at two zones, a zone of elastic deformation, where stress and strain are proportional. And the gradient is defined by Young's modulus, which is the resistance to intraatomic separation for that type of atom. And that in this zone, the deformation is reversible. We contrast this with going past this point where we now go into plastic deformation, where we have non-linear deformation. And it's non-linear because it's to do with dislocation slip. And we know that that is quite chaotic and disorganized and requires progressively greater force to move the dislocations, which really don't want to move. And eventually they all join up at the grain boundaries where they can't go any further, the stress is rising, we have failure. So that is the end. But before we go, you know, as Colombo would say, one more thing. If the stress keeps increasing as we're getting these dislocations to move, why is it at the stress strain curve, we have this downward slope where the stress is going down before the point of failure? And this is something you see in all the graphical representations of stress strain failure of metals. That really doesn't make sense from anything I've said. So what I'd like you to do is go away and read up and try to solve that mystery of why that happens. And it has a very simple, inelegant explanation.
So this is the reading that I would recommend for basic science, so Callister for materials and Norden and Frankel for um, biomechanics. Uh, thank you. All the best. Thank you, Asad. That was a good talk. I enjoyed it. Uh, do we have any other burning questions? Anybody? I think we can ask the questions in the end. That, thank you, Asad. That was very good. Uh, this is the first time I realized why do the plates break. Now I know why they break. Great. Um, so let's go on to the next talk. Kim Lamin talking about imaging and how it is important. My name is Kim Lamin and my talk is on imaging for the FRCS. I'll be covering x-rays, CT scans, ultrasound, MRI, bone scans and DEXA scans. X-rays are the commonest used imaging modality in orthopaedics. They were discovered by Wilhelm Roentgen in 1895. They're a form of high energy radiation on the electromagnetic spectrum. When an X-ray is produced, it passes through the body's tissues to a different amount depending on the tissue, and this is what's utilised to produce the image. X-rays are produced by heating a negative cathode made of tungsten to incandescence in a vacuum, and this occurs at 2,200 degrees Celsius. This heating results in thermionic emission and electrons are emitted cathode. These are drawn towards a positive anode also made of tungsten. The electrons hit the focal spot of the anode at approximately half the speed of light and what's produced depends on where they hit the focal spot. The electrons hitting the inner electrons and knocking them out of orbit or heading towards the nucleus and slowing and changing direction produce x-rays. Those that hit the outer electrons of the target produce heat. The process is inefficient and 99% of what's produced is heat and therefore the anode has to rotate to dissipate the heat. Once the x-rays are emitted from the machine, they have a number of possible fates. Some are scattered, and this is why we use dosiometers to check the background dose in the operating theatre or the x-ray department. Some are absorbed by the tissue that they try to pass through, and some are transmitted through. This results in attenuation and allows production of the image by the x-rays falling on a cassette. Traditionally, we used x-ray cassettes, which are are made of five layers. The first layer is essentially a filter and this removes the low energy x-rays which are essentially of no diagnostic value and it makes the image clearer. On either side of the film are intensifying screens which help to convert the x-rays into light and lying between these is a film coated in silver iodobromide. At the back of the x-ray cassette, there's a lead back to prevent the radiation passing through further and backscattering into the room. We've obviously moved on to digital imaging, and this uses a phosphor-based plate, which actually reduces the overall radiation dose. The images can then be digitally stored and actually can be manipulated to try and improve the quality of the image and what can be seen. X-ray has a number of advantages and disadvantages. It's cheap, easy to obtain and good for assessing bone, but it does come with a dose of ionising radiation and it can miss subtle bony destruction. Moving on from X-ray, this is a, an image of the CT scanner and CT or computed tomography is obviously based on X-ray. It was introduced by Sir Godfrey Hounsfield in 1973 and it uses a fan-shaped X-ray beam which axially rotates around the patient. The detectors are static and these pick up the X-rays in much the same way as they pass through when taking an X-ray itself. With a CT scanner, each rotation produces an axial slice through the body. And initially this was a slow process and there had to be pauses between each axial rotation. However, this has sped up with new generations of scanners. Different tissues attenuate the signal to a different level and there is an attenuation coefficient with CT scanning. They're all judged relative to water, which is zero Hounsfield units. Tissues with a high attenuation, such as bone with the highest attenuation 
appear white, and those with a low attenuation, such as air with the lowest attenuation, appear dark. The image is made up of pixels, which essentially mark each point on the patient in that slice. But because there is a volume to these, these become voxels. The image has to be manipulated, and this is where we get windows on the CT scanner. And this is because there are insufficient shades of grey compared to the number of attenuation coefficients. So the image has to be focused on the tissue or the area that you wish to look at. The CT scanner produces transverse sections in high resolution, and these can be reformatted into other planes or into 3D reconstructions. CT is generally used for fracture patterns and preoperative planning. It can have contrast added to it to assess joints and intervertebral discs, and it can have a quantitative element and assess bone densiometry. It has advantages of being three-dimensional imaging and cross-sectional imaging. It's good for bone and it can guide interventional procedures and it can provide quantitative data. The disadvantages are the ionizing radiation dose, which is significantly higher than the X-ray. It's not as good at visualizing soft tissue at as an MRI, but better than an X-ray. And it can be claustrophobic, however, less so than the MR scanner. Ultrasound is an imaging modality that uses sound waves of a high frequency. The tissue that the ultrasound passes into reflects and refracts these waves and the returned waves are converted into the image. The image is based on the transmission or the refraction of the sound waves and the amount coming back and the time taken for them to return. The key to understanding ultrasound is piezoelectric crystals. If a DC current or is applied and then reversed or an AC current applied to these crystals, the crystals will expand and contract and change shape, producing the ultrasound wave. This is transmitted to the skin with gel to allow better transmission of the wave. The wave is then reflected back by tissue interfaces and that wave returns to the trans and when the wave hits the crystals, this again causes a distortion of their shape and this generates a voltage which can be used to make the image. When generating the image, the more waves reflected, the larger the voltage generated and therefore the brighter the image. The time period taken is also taken into account when producing the image and this gives an indication of the depth of the structure. So it's a combination of brightness and depth that allows the image to be produced. Ultrasound is used in suspected tendon and muscle ruptures. It can be used with joint aspirations and looking for joint effusions. It's used in assessing lumps and masses and can look at abscesses. And it also has its use in screening in DDH. The advantages are that this is a modality without any ionizing radiation. It's dynamic, so the patient can be moving their arm or leg while the scan is performed. It shows soft tissues well, and it can be brought to the patient. It's inexpensive, has no side effects, and isn't invasive, and it can be used to guide interventional procedures. The problems with it are its user dependency. The interpretation of the image is based on the user. Bob D. Habitus can be an issue and it can be difficult to characterise masses. It also doesn't penetrate bone. Here's a picture of an MRI scanner. MRI, I understood at the time of the FRCS by remembering protons, precession and phase. MRI detects abnormal water distribution and it works with radio frequency signals which are emitted from the tissues. These signals are used to build the image. It detects hydrogen nuclei or protons in water and the image reflects the concentration of the water. There are a number of different sequences but the main ones are T1 and T2. T1 is good for anatomy and T2 for pathology with fluid producing a high signal. It works because in nature nuclear, nuclear spin occurs, so protons spin like a top around an axis. When the patient is placed in a strong static magnetic field, the axes align and the protons wobble about the axes at a fixed frequency, which is precession. 
if a radio frequency pulse is then applied, this will realign the axes. The precession of each of the protons times with each other, and this is phase. Relaxation occurs when the radio frequency pulse is turned off, and changes in the field are what are picked up by the scanner's receiving coils in order to produce the image. When the pulse stops, the protons dephase and they return to their original axes. The T1 and T2 images are produced by T1 longitudinal relaxation, which is the time for the longitudinal magnetization vector to recover 63% of maximum. T2 is transverse relaxation, so it's the time for the transverse magnetization to fall to 37% of maximum. MRI is commonly used in orthopedics, and it's often used for AVN infection, tumours, occult fractures and soft tissue injuries. It has the advantage of being a multi-planar form of imaging with, again, no ionising radiation, and it's good for soft tissues and bone marrow. Unfortunately, it does have absolute and relative contraindications. It's more costly than some of the other imaging modalities. There are a number of things that can produce artifacts such as movement and ferromagnetic objects. People often can't have an MRI because of claustrophobia, and it isn't as good in looking at bone as a CT scan. Its contraindications can be divided into absolute and relative, and the absolute contraindications include pacemakers and internal defibrillators, cerebral aneurysm clips, intraocular metal foreign bodies, which can be looked for with an X-ray prior to a scan, vascular clips that are less than two weeks old, internal hearing aids, and dorsal, dorsal column simulate, stimulators. The next form of imaging is bone scans. These are a form of nuclear medicine that involves the injection of a radionuclide. This is an unstable nucleus which disintegrates, releasing gamma radiation. The commonest used one in orthopaedics is technetium 99M, and this is incorporated into hydroxyapatite crystals in the bone. This allows a reflection of the osteoblastic activity within the bone and a scintillation gamma camera can convert the gamma radiation to light using sodium iodide crystals. The hotspots are recorded from areas of increased blood flow, increased cellular activity and mineral turnover and metabolic bone disease. Bone scans are typically divided into three phases, although some do allow for a fourth phase at 24 hours later. The first phase is the flow or dynamic images, which occur at one to two minutes, and this is the arterial phase. The second is the blood pool or equilibrium state, which is at three to five minutes and shows extracellular fluid in the soft tissues and bone hyperemia. And the third phase is the static or delayed phase at four hours, which indicates the skeletal activity. There are a number of tissues which have normal activity on bone scans, including the bladder and kidneys, as the technetium is excreted renally. The ends of long bones can show up, as well as the SI joints, tips of the scapulae, nasal cavity and growth plates in children. Bone scans are used in occult bone pain, metastatic disease, tumours, infection, and can be used in Paget's disease or heterotrophic ossification to check if these conditions have burnt out. They're very sensitive and allow whole body imaging with initial localization of multiple bone lesions. The drawback is that they are non-specific and therefore, although they will pick up an area of activity, they may not tell you precisely what the area of activity is. The doses involved are relatively high in terms of the radiation dose. And there are a number of false negatives, including myeloma, lytic METs, and burnt out Paget's disease. The final form of imaging that I'll be discussing is DEXA scans, which are dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. These quantify bone mineral density and use two different energy X-rays. Different proportions of the X-rays are absorbed by the bone and you can scan the hip, the spine or the wrist, the first two being the most accurate. 
In order to do a DEXA scan, we'll take around about two minutes. The patient lies in the scanner in light clothing. If performing a scan of the femur, this is an AP scan, and if it's of the lumbar spine, this is lateral. The L3 vertebrae is the most commonly scanned due to the fact that the ribs will overlie other vertebrae and the iliac crests will overlie the more distal vertebrae. For a lumbar spine scan, the patient lies flat on their back with their knee flexed at right angles to eliminate the lordosis. And for the femur, they lie flat on their back with their toes together and their heels separated approximately 23 centimetres. DEXA scans are used to assess bone density mainly, but can be used in the assessing the effects of treatment in osteoporosis and measuring periprosthetic bone loss. They have the advantages of trying to assess a patient's fracture risk and their osteoporosis to allow treatment. The disadvantages are that they don't distinguish between cortical and cancellous bone. There can be false readings in osteoarthritis due to the sclerosis with calcification or with previous surgery or fractures that have healed. The femur measures a wide area when scanning and isn't necessarily specific in its area. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Kim. I think we have a um, few questions. Shall we answer them at the end? Uh, yeah, I think let's do that. Yeah. yeah. Let's we'll one more presentation ahead. remaining. Yeah. We'll go by, uh, through each one of them uh, sequentially at the end. I will go on to the last presentation. Um, we're going to talk to you about statistics and how you can, uh, an orthopedic surgeon can use them in their practice. Talk about basics in statistics today to you and how it can be useful for uh, orthopedic surgeons. So what exactly is statistics? It is a science of collecting data, summarizing data, and presenting it and interpreting to estimate the size and the strength of association between different variables. And what are these variables? Everything these days is dependent on data. These are observation from a given population where you can extrapolate your results from a sample population to the total population. The sample population will depend on the size and your variable that you're studying, its number of individuals who will contribute to the data set, and the variables are the attributes that you study of that particular individual, which can be age, gender, or their outcome measures. So these variables can be of various types. They can be categorical. You need to know what kind of variable that you're studying. Is it an ordinal categorical data, which is ordered like disease stages one, two, or three, or it is an unordered nominal categorical data, which like blood groups, A, B, A, B, and O. But most commonly you'll have numerical data, which can be either studied as a ratio, which is a continuous data like blood pressure, or it cannot be in a ratio where it's called discrete or an integer with like visit numbers. You have to look at whether the data is likely to be parametric or non-parametric, or it is a quantitative uh, data type or qualitative data type, which determines what kind of statistical tests then you can apply on that data set. What are the various levels of evidence? The most common is the highest, one, which is level one evidence, is good quality meta-analysis done on multiple randomized controlled trial with narrow confidence intervals. The le level below it will be a blinded randomized controlled trial, a single study, uh, or a cohort study. Cohort study is a uh, prospective study in a population which is studied over time where the disease has not occurred, but we study the patient uh, risk factors with risk factors over time to see whether they develop that disease. Or retrospective study, again, observational study like case control, uh, 
you have case series or single case reports or ideas or opinions, which is level four evidence. So how do you set up these randomized controlled trials, which are thought to be the best quality data? It is a long and arduous process. You have methodology, statistician, clinicians, and patients sitting together to set up the study, establish a proposal, write down a protocol of what actually we are looking at, how we're going to do it, and then you get the funding around it through NIHR or other bodies which fund these big trials. You build the study, collect the data, analyze the data, and then publish it, and ultimately closing the project based on GCP guidelines. These big trials like PROFA study or Seesaw draft trials took years publish and then study, but they led to high quality publications. So meta-analyses, which are considered to be the best type of evidence, are multiple randomized trials, uh, looking at narrow uh, confidence intervals. It combines uh, study data from several studies to come up with a single numerical estimate, which gives you an idea of what is the evidence like, but it all depends on what you put in the qualities of studies which go in and whether they have any the same question, research question they're looking at. Uh, and it will depend on whether you are able to look at the confidence intervals, p-values, and come up with these forest plots, which gives us the risk ratio of one type of condition compared to the other type of condition. But when it comes to diagnostic tests, there are some basic statistical techniques which you have to apply, like prevalence, which is the number of cases present in that population at a given time. So today, what is the number of cases of COVID-19 in the population will give you prevalence. The incidence is the number of new cases in that population, which occur over a unit time. New cases happening with COVID-19 in the last one month will give you the incidence. If you uh, look at prevalence, it is equivalent to the incidence times the disease duration. Prevalence is usually higher than the incidence in chronic conditions, but it can be the same in acute conditions like common cold. Then for these uh, diagnostic tests, we look at sensitivity and specificity, and also the predictive values of this test. So sensitivity is the number of true positives divided by the overall number of patients with a positive test which have the disease. Specificity, number of true negatives divided by the number of people who have not got the disease, and this helps to come up with a positive predictive value or a negative predictive value. So if you look at this example uh, of CRP, in periprostatic joint infections, if you look at uh, where you think there is periprostatic infection present, whether the CRP is positive or negative, that will give us the sensitivity. So 25 over 26 gives us 96%. So if you have a, uh, the CRP has a sensitivity of 96% and specificity of 92%, which is dependent on number of negatives, uh, divided by the total number of negative patients who have got a negative test and no infection. But the CRP has a positive predictive value of only 74%, which depends on number of cases who have tested positive divided by the number of cases who are actually positive. And the negative predictive value, which is the best for CRP, is 99%. If you think there's negative CRP test, then you're very unlikely to have any joint infections. So as I said to you before, most of the time, study only a sample of the population and look at the results. And whether that can be applied to the total population is an important question to look at before you start studying that sample population. So when you come up with these results, you have to look at the data, you look at the central tendency like mean or median, uh, mean being average, median being the commonest value, and also the mode can be studied for the data depending on the skew present or not. Um, 
Oh, and also, in addition to the central tendency, we look at the variability of the spread of the data around the mean, which for non-parametric studies will be presented as range or percentiles, but for parametric studies, we look at the variance of the data, standard deviation of the data, or standard error of the data. Most of the time, if you look at multiple population, you come up with a mean for that whole population, a standard deviation, and a standard error, which is dependent on the sample size. The standard error of the mean, which is uh, for the total population, is distribution of the mean obtained over multiple samples. And most of the time, it is normally distributed. And this is usually equal to the population mean. That means you can apply that sample size data uh, onto the population. The standard deviation, uh, which is obtained from these multiple samples divided by the square root of, of sample size gives you the standard error of mean. So these statistical distributions can be bell-shaped, where it is normal or Gaussian distribution. It can be bimodal, like in um, distribution of shoulder dislocation, which can happen early in the age or later in the age. The positive skew, where there is tail towards the right side, or the negative skew, where the tail is towards the left side. All these studies have a number of biases, which we have to look at before we start the study. Have we got any selection bias? How are we choosing these subjects? There's likely to be a recall bias, whether the presence of this disorder can be recalled by the subject or not. There's sampling bias, when the subjects are not representative of the actual total population, or the look back bias, where you're not looking at the data at the appropriate time. And how do you reduce the bias? You can blind the subjects or blind the observers. You can use a placebo. Very difficult in a surgical trials, but there are a number of studies which are doing it with a sham procedure, which is looked at compared to the surgical procedure. The crossover studies where you can give one type of treatment and later on the same sample of the population is given a different type of treatment, look at their different outcomes, or you can randomize the population choosing randomly which arm the subjects go into, not decided by the patient, not decided by the surgeons. And we look at statistical hypotheses. We assume there is a null hypothesis in the beginning where there's no difference between the disease or the risk factors. But there has to be an alternative hypothesis where there's some difference. That means there is some association between the disease and the risk factors. And then we come up with a p-value. And most of the time it is taken as 0.05, which is the probability that the test statistic will at least be in that extreme 5% of the population, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. This is where you're likely to lie in that small 5% by chance. It's a probability that the result is true or correct. Okay, sorry, it is not probability the result is true and correct in that last 5%. So there are two types of errors which can be introduced in the studies. Uh, the type 1 error, stating that there is a difference or effect when none exists, where you're rejecting the null hypothesis, but actually it is not true. Where you saw the difference, but it doesn't exist. You're convicting an innocent man, usually taken as a p-value of 0 0.05, which is indicated that by chance that your data will lie in that 5%. For well, the type 2 error, which is more important, which is stating that there is not an effect when the actual effect exists. We did not see the difference when the, your, there was a difference. You're setting a guilty man free. So if you look at these two um, peaks, you look at the null hypothesis, which is in green, and the alternative hypothesis, which is in the purple, the beta error is lying in this orange bar. So you're likely to look at this orange bar and come up with the power of study, which is one minus the beta error, um, indicating that this is beyond in the purple zone. So you look at whether you're keeping at 90% power of that study 
coming up with a sample size calculation or 80% power in that study. So the power is probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is actually false. This depends on the total number of endpoints, either it is one-tailed or two-tailed, the difference in compliance, whether it's crossover between treatment groups. And the, it is the probability of study of the given size to detect a statistical difference of a given magnitude. If you increase sample size, you increase the power of the study. So power calculations are affected by the size of the mean of the differences, your variability, the spread of the data, what are you accepting as a level of significance, the variability between observations, the experimental design, are you using a t-test or ANOVA? You have to decide before, and what is the type of data? Usually you have to go back and look at a small sample or a previous study, which has studied the standard deviation in that alternative hypothesis, null hypothesis, and come up with the power of your study and the sample size based on the power you've decided. And finally, if the patients or the subjects enter into the study at the time they decide or come out of the study at the time they want, like in joint placements, you can look at them through Kepler-Meyer curves. This is also known as a product limit estimator, which gives an estimate of the survival of that joint replacement using life and time data. So you can look at how these joints are surviving and whether this is the patient is censored when it has come out of the study due to revision surgery or death or the, the data get lost, something else happens to that patient and it's not in the study anymore. And you can look at the study populations over time, uh, like this one for the joint replacement to look at the survival probability of that joint and compare between those different joints using log rank test. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Um, Anna, should we start taking questions? Yeah. So there were two questions on the uh, Q&A. So the first one is, how long after insertion of metal, either titanium or stainless steel, implants into bone, it is safe for the patients to undergo MRI scan? So shall I answer this one? Harvinder? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh Asad, do you want to take this one? Uh, I don't actually feel that confident. Okay. I'll yeah. be honest. Uh, <laughs> I'll answer this question. Thanks, yeah. So, um, ideally, if you have put a metal work, a metal on the on the bone, and uh, ideally, it's, it's because when you do an MRI scan, it generates a bit of heat around the metal, so there can be a bit of loss of, uh, I mean, there might be some damage to the granulation tissue and things, but that is not a rule. If you have to do an emergency MRI scan, uh, the radiologist can do it for you. Say you've done a fixation of a spine and you feel that the nerve is trapped or there is a hematoma, you won't wait for six weeks. You will have to get it uh, immediately. So you can... Uh, most metal these days, they have uh, they are MRI compatible, and they have special sequences. The the radiologist they call MAS, that's metal artifact reduction sequences, and they can they can give you a reasonable picture. But if you can wait six weeks, say especially after fracture or major surgery, then it's better. But uh, you can have it done as an emergency if required. I don't know if that answers the question. Thanks, Pandey. Um, Asad, there's a question for you. Please, can you explain strain hardening? Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, that is actually a whole new talk. Um, one thing I didn't go into is when we talked about this lattice and we talked about imperfections, I'm sure the more, uh, you know, the astute amongst you would have said, um, hang on, you haven't mentioned what happens when we have different atoms mixed into the lattice. So we have interstitial atoms um, or substitution atoms. So atoms of carbon, uh, for instance, you can they can be found in metal and they may take the place of one of the metal atoms 
or uh, like as a substitution, or they may be an interstitial atom where they actually nestle between. So the presence of these atoms, you can imagine, will affect the movement of dislocations. And often it's a favorable effect because it inhibits their movement and therefore you need more stress to get the dislocations moving and therefore more stress before failure. So the different methods of hardening metals, when we think about age hardening and work hardening, age hardening is where you're often looking at basically carbon and other atoms accumulating over time within the metal and they basically are improving its strength properties by limiting the movement of dislocations when we talk about work hardening if we go back to my graph of the stress strain curve and i said about how once we go into the zone of plastic deformation when we unload it we don't come back down we base, you know, to zero, we come down parallel to the elastic portion of the curve to a point where there has been some plastic deformation. Now, when you reload the metal, you climb back up the elastic portion of the curve. But now where you enter the curve for plastic deformation, you're at a higher point. So therefore, the material now is stronger because you have, you know, you've reached a higher point on the curve in terms of the stress you have to impart before plastic deformation starts to take effect. So if you think about the stress strain curve as a sequence of points of loading and unloading, as you go along the elastic portion, you unload, you go straight back down to zero. But in the plastic part of the curve, as you deform and you go up, you come down parallel, but you don't go down to zero you come back to a point where there is some residual deformation. Now, when you load it, you go back up on a gradient of the elastic portion, but you enter the curve at a higher point where you need more stress to start causing plastic deformation. And this is effectively the method that when you look in like in all the movies and the guy's making the samurai sword and he's like beating it and putting it in the fire and then beating it again, effectively what he's doing is he's basically deforming the metal and then heating it up, deforming it again, and he's taking it further up the stress strain curve. So now that metal exists at a higher point on the stress strain curve, so it can absorb a lot more energy before plastic deformation starts happening and moving towards failure. That was a very complex description in the absence of any slide, so I do apologize. Very Thanks, well. Thank you. Well done, I was wondering if I could ask uh, Professor Rajan a very simple question. Can he can he unmute? Rohan, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Uh, very simple question. What's the BMI on gate? Or as does the sex affect the male or female affect the gate? Because I mean the 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 population, general population who are coming to Leicester for surgery. Their BMI is going up. So does that have an effect on gait? Uh, the simple answer is yes. Uh, as your BMI goes up, it affects your center of gravity. And therefore, when you walk uh, your gait, you are always trying to balance your center, uh, center of gravity. So when they tend to walk, they have uh, a lot of sway, uh, medial and lateral sway, to mm -hmm. try and push the center of, of gravity to the center. But because of their size, that's why you see these big people swaying as they're walking forwards. So that's the effect of gait. Of course, there's loads of other effects such as the forces, etc. But the simple answer for gait is that that's a straightforward answer. There's lots of sway when they're walking to, to push the center of gravity to the center. Thank you, Prof. You're welcome. Uh, Panda, you may want to take this question. This is for Kim, actually, who could not join uh, us today. Is the CT bone densitometry better than DEXA scan? Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any of the panelists wants to answer this, you're most welcome. Uh, Mr. Qureshi, I, I told you he's a thinking orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> well, I only know this because I've had to do some research trying to work out bone density on CT. And the issue is, is it is better but it's, it is technically very challenging because essentially what you need to do is, is when you CT 
you know, whatever you're looking for, the density, uh, whether it's organic or inorganic. At the same time, you have to CT a phantom. So you have to CT the material of basically known density so that then when you look at the, the characteristics of the silhouette on CT, you can use it for a quantitative calibration to say exactly what is the density of bone on this or the density of whatever you're looking at. So that in itself introduces so many technical hurdles that having something that is probably less accurate but more easily available and has been proven to be reproducible in terms of a DEXA scan is actually a better option. So it actually comes down to really the complexities and logistics of measurement rather than the most accurate modality. Thank, Thank you for that. That was brilliant. Um, uh, if I could ask uh, Professor Rajan one more question. Um, uh, Rohan, you know, we have a lot of patients who undergo surgery like rotator cuff repairs and they are in a sling for a certain time uh, after surgery. And they find that the sling not only is cumbersome because they can't look after themselves, but they actually lose balance. They tend to fall a lot uh, while they are in a sling. Is that something you have studied or looked at before? Rohan? Um, I think we've lost Rohan. Okay. There was another question come in for Professor Rajan. Okay. He is not here. Yes, uh, he's back. Rohan here. <laughs> Oh, Bindus, I'm so sorry, I missed that. Uh, you said about your patients in a sling. What, what was the question? Yeah, so, um, you know, when while they're in a sling, they struggle to mobilize and they lose balance. Something they have told me, like they tend to fall over. Is sure. that something you could, uh, I don't know, you've studied before or you've uh, come across this? Yes, well, I did mention um, that one of the things in gait analysis we analyze is the reciprocal arm movement. Um, which, as I told you, in children, it doesn't come to the adult um, uh, reciproc reciprocality um, till the age of four. So likewise, if you um, tie an arm in a harness, etc., it does affect your balance in terms of your gait. Um, so one of the things we're doing is uh, studying people um, running over hurdles at the moment in Derby University. And we, <laughs> we are looking at um, people uh, with running with uh, blades as well. Um, but we find that those who are uh, triple amputees, for example, or upper limb and lower limb, the gait is completely different because there's an imbalance um, in their gait. So the answer is yes. If you harness, if you harness the, um, sorry about that, in the car, if you harness the, um, <laughs> the, um, the arm, then it will affect your gait, yes. Um, Rohan, there's another question come for you. Um, you know, as a as a knee surgeon, a lay orthopedic surgeon, when should we come to the gait lab? Any additional answers gait labs can provide to come up with a treatment plan for a knee surgeon? Um, but for soft tissue, because you can see that uh, patients have a significant thrust or a thrust when they are walking, for example, with uh, ligament uh, injuries. So you can pick that up quite. But we don't really make recommendations for um, knee surgery for our knee uh, surgeons, either arthroplasty or soft tissue. I'm just saying that when you analyze the gait, you can see differences with those with soft tissue injuries. It's great. Right. Uh, Harvinda, can I ask uh, our learned friend, Mr. Qureshi, another question? Um, yeah. Asad, what is hardness and toughness? <laughs> Is it, we hear a lot of it's a hard metal, strong metal. Is there, is there a difference between these terminologies? There is actually. Um, actually, one thing that is very important to establish in materials is what things are intrinsic material properties and what things actually depend on the structure of, of that material. So when we look at um, Young's modulus, Young's modulus is a material property. 
So whether you take a small bit of metal or you take a big bit of metal, you submit it to the appropriate testing and Young's modulus always comes out the same. Whereas when we think about things like strength and strength is that upper point on the stress strain curve, that has very much to do with, you know, has this metal been loaded before or unloaded? So, you know, properties like strength, toughness and hardness need to be distinguished from intrinsic uh, material properties. So what are these? So strength we've talked about as being the highest point on the stress strain curve. Hardness is actually a characteristic of surfaces. So if I look at like this, my mobile phone, and I think, well, actually, if I take my finger, can I indent the surface? I can't, you know, to what extent can I basically dent the surface is really a measure of hardness. So there's lots of different ways of actually measuring it and um, and expressing it. Uh, but essentially, that's what hardness is. Toughness is if we think about a stress strain curve and we think, OK, you know, you've said about how you got this elastic portion and then there's this plastic deformation. And then there's quite some time, quite a lot of deformation before it eventually fractures. So. We talked about the strength being the apex of the curve, but what toughness engenders is what is the area under the curve. And I think the easiest way to think about that is something like rubber. Rubber is not very strong. Yeah, as in you get it and you stretch it and it basically requires minimal force and you're stretching it and stretching it and it's deforming and it's deforming. But rubber will accept an excessive amount of deformation before failure. So you will keep stretching that rubber and it will not fail. Unlike, say, a ceramic plate. So if you take a ceramic plate, a ceramic plate is very strong. You know, it's not like rubber. You know, you can stretch rubber. But you can't take a plate from the kitchen and stretch it. You know, that plate basically, it will take a lot of force. But once it takes force, it will snap and it will break. Conversely, rubber will take a lot of deformation and a lot of stress over a continuous period before it finally like snaps. So that is the contrast between rubber, which is not strong, but tough, versus something like a ceramic plate, which is strong, but really isn't very tough. Thank you very much, Asad. Um... Uh, Arvind Singh, shall we draw this? I think um, I do not see any other questions in the question Q&A panel. And I think we've answered most of the um, questions in the chat box that I can see. Um, back to you, Sanjeev. Thank you. I, I No questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thanks, Asad, uh, Rohan, uh, Pandey, and Harvind. I really appreciate it. And uh, pass my thanks to Ms. Lemon as well for uh, excellent talk. Uh, really enjoyed the talk, learned quite a lot of new things, and I'm really grateful for your time on a weekend. So thanks a lot. As I said, this talk will be available later on Bias YouTube channel and on Ortho TV if uh, any of your trainees or colleagues want to listen to this talk later. So thank you. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.